Hello everyone. Today we're going to briefly discuss how one can better understand German idealism from its context and the history of philosophy. For many people who encounter philosophy for the first time, who are not students of philosophy, who haven't majored in philosophy, who haven't gone on to grad school for philosophy, their first encounter with philosophy is usually through existentialism. Existentialism is a very popular modern philosophy. We see it in our art and culture every day. So it's not a surprise that many people's first encounter with philosophy is through the philosophy of existentialism. And existentialism, of course, is a derivation of German idealism. If you were to pick up John Paul Sartre's Being in Nothingness and read the first paragraph in its introduction, Sartre explains that modern philosophy is an attempt to resolve the crisis of dualism. Now again, if you are not a student of philosophy, you will wonder, what is this crisis of dualism? What is Jean-Paul Sartre's Being in Nothingness about? What is the entire elaborate work of philosophy dealing with? Why is he constantly referencing back to Heidegger, Hegel, and Christian theology? To understand German idealism and its offshoot existentialism, we have to understand what that crisis of dualism is. And in order to do that, we have to go back to the very beginning, the beginning of philosophy, ancient Greece, with pre-Socratic philosophy, and then, of course, post-Socratic philosophy, as well as the theologies of Augustinian Christianity, which, as William Barrett explained in his great book, Irrational Man, which was a popular study and exposition on existentialism, to understand existentialism, we have to understand the Greek philosophies and the Christian theologies that were being wrestled with by German idealists and then eventually existentialist philosophers. So in my 80-minute brief explanation over the history of philosophy, I basically argued that philosophy can be understood as this tension between the philosophies concerned with the external world and the philosophies con concerned with the interior world. Pre-Socratic Greek philosophy was one of those movements concerned with the nature of the outer world, the external world, the world of objects and things, the world of external matter. This is why for many people today, ancient Greek philosophy seems to have certain parallels with modern science. While that connection is deeply superficial, the broad-based similarity that one detects in its immediate reading of pre-Socratic philosophy is nevertheless true. Pre-Socratic philosophy is concerned with the world of objects and things, the world of external nature and matter. Pre-Socratic philosophy is not concerned with questions of the self, subjectivity, consciousness, the human heart, personality, ethics, and morality. That is what occurs in the Platonic or the Socratic revolution in Greek philosophy. Now, while it is true that Platonic philosophy is still deeply concerned with the external world, after all, Plato's idea of the forms is actually meant to be observable in the outer world that we see occurring, that we live in, that we engage in, what Platonic philosophy does within the Greek philosophical tradition is it begins to carve out a path, a path for the development of personality, of character, of individual inclinations of the human heart, which will eventually be subsumed by Christianity. We must remember that Platonic philosophy, the Platonic dialogues, are written in dramatic 
form, we encounter characters and personalities, which is why it is Platonic philosophy in particular that eventually gets subsumed into the Augustinian theological project. Augustinian theology is the other core component to understand in order for us to better know what the crisis of dualism is actually about. While Greek philosophy is predominantly concerned with the outer world, the world of objects and things, Christian theology is concerned with the inner world. It is concerned with the human heart, with personhood and personality. Anyone with a basic understanding and a basic education in Christian theology should know this. God, after all, is not a thing or an object, but a person. Jesus Christ was the second person of the Trinity. Christian theology, then, concerns itself with the nature of the self, of persons, personhood, and personality. It is Augustine's theological project which places its emphasis and understanding of the human being in the human heart and the dynamism of personality, the human agency that comes from love, which eventually gives rise to the philosophies of individualism and the self. A number of great books deal with this subject, including Larry Sidentop's Inventing the Individual, The Origins of Western Liberalism, where he goes out and explains the theological history of our modern views of personality, personhood, and the self. You also have Jean Bethke Elstein's Sovereignty, God, State, and Self, in which she goes through the history of philosophy and explains how we derived our ideas of the sovereign self. One very important passage that Elstein notes is when she's dealing with Augustine. In his work on the Trinity, De, Trin De Trinitate, one of Augustine's most important works, she says, Augustine stresses our capacity to love, and he dethrones, not reason, but too narrow an understanding of rationalism. And this too narrow understanding of rationalism is going to be very important as we move further into modern philosophy. So Augustine's theology places its emphasis on the human heart, our ability and capacity to love and the personal agency that is derived from the individual human heart. This eventually leads over the course of a thousand years of this idea maturing and growing within the Christian theological tradition to the philosophies of individualization in Duns Scotus and nominalism in William of Ockham. So in the principle of individualization, all things really exist and are only knowable in their individual form. And of course, the philosophy of nominalism, which builds on this, argues that all things that we encounter in the world are only encountered in an individuated personal reality. While we have conceptual categories like rock and dog, man, woman, and cat, William of Ockham's nominalism asserts that we only ever encounter these conceptual categories in individual personal form. While we might say all of these things are rocks, the reality is we only ever encounter a single rock. There is that rock, this rock, and that rock. There is that dog, this dog, and that dog. There is that person, this person, and that person. Right, So what develops in the history of Christian theology is this unity of object and subject, of personality and thing, which derives from Augustine's theology of the self. So for a thousand years, we have this unity of object and subject, of thing and self, of subjectivity and personality with material form. But with the rise of modern philosophy, 
as Leo Strauss explained in Natural Right and History, what we have is this paradoxical elimination of theology, which brings us back to pre-Socratic philosophy with its concern of objects and things of material matter and form only, alongside the belief of a malleable, completely changeable nature that can change through the rise of science, our use of science, technology, and human willpower. This, of course, is modern philosophy, the philosophy of the new science, as explained by Francis Bacon. In the new science, our philosophical disposition is concerned only with outer objects, matter, object, form, and thing. We are no longer concerned with the inner world. We are no longer concerned with the philosophy of self-subjectivity. That is something that Descartes is going to be concerned with, which leads to this new crisis of dualism. If human beings are only, as Thomas Hobbes said, matter in motion, if we are only bodies, if we are only material substance and form, moving through the cosmos according to the laws of physics and thermodynamics, then where is this concern for the self? How do we have subjectivity? How do we have agency? Modern philosophy therefore splits along two lines. One, the reductive Augustinianism that we find in Descartes and Cartesianism, which places all emphasis and all understanding on simply the human self, the subject, and thought, the famous cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, and the philosophy of the new science, derived from Bacon, Hobbes, and Locke, leading, of course, to the formation of utilitarianism with Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill, to today's so-called philosophy of scientism, where all of our concern is simply with bodies, simply with matter, simply with object and thing. So you can see what happens here in the 16th and the 17th and the 18th century is this elimination of that original synthesis that was derived from Christian theology, where object and subject thing, self, and person were all connected together as one. And so this is what Jean-Paul Sartre is referring to when he says modern philosophy is an attempt to deal with the embarrassment of dualism. This is what German idealism is all about. German idealism is the restorative attempt within philosophy to bring back the unity of object and subject, of thing and self, of individual ethical, ethical morality with the reality of living in a material world. This was the project of Immanuel Kant. And of course, Immanuel Kant's philosophy of the thing in itself and the autonomous subject is that attempt to bridge the unity of object and subject together again. Kant eventually arrives at the conclusion that we can never truly know the thing itself. So all we're left with is the self-subjectivity and the autonomous self in relation to that thing itself. We have thought in relation to object to matter. But because Kant was unable to provide the answer of what the thing itself is, this is what leads to post-Kantian idealism, the philosophies of Fichte, Schelling, and Hegel, who were all dissatisfied with Kant's supposed inability to resolve that crisis of object and subject. So German idealism, in, in its proper understanding in its context and history is the attempt to resolve that crisis. How do we restore the reality 
of being an object body, something that has material substance and form, while also being a subject, somebody who has personality, somebody who possesses the human heart and agency, who possesses the ability to reason and has consciousness. Eventually, German idealism splits back into the very two conceptual philosophical movements of modernity, materialism and subjectivism. German idealism on its materialist track leads to Feuerbach and Marx and the formation of political socialism and communism. And then you also have it moving down the direction of the philosophy of self subjectivity, the egoism of Max Stirner. And thus, we have in our world today this continued dynamic, this continued tension between the philosophy of objects, matter, form, and science on one hand, and the philosophies of the self, of subjectivity, of personality, and personhood on another track. Now, when we look over the cultural and intellectual discussions and conflicts we are having today, we realize that we are still wrestling with the very crisis of dualism that German idealism was trying to reconcile. Our contemporary crisis is the crisis of dualism. We see it in our rhetoric and in our politics and in our culture. You have, paradoxically, both on the far left and the far right, this obsessive concern with just material substance and form. No consideration for subjectivity, for self, for personality and personhood is in the philosophies of material form. It's just you're a body. You are just material form. You are just material matter. You are just matter in motion. You have no free will. You are just a body being pushed along by the forces of physics. There is no inner world to be concerned with. And yet, we also see in reaction to this materialism, to this strict scientism, the philosophies of the expressive self, of subjectivism, which again derive both from the theology of Augustine and the German idealist tradition with its emphasis on self-consciousness. And so you have this clash between objects, things, matter, and substantive form with the philosophies of the self, of subjectivity, of consciousness, of personhood, and personality. Our conflict today is this, we are still wrestling with the problem that modern philosophy produced in its separation of self-subjectivity from material objects and things. We, human beings, are complex creatures. We understand intuitively that we have thought process, that we have this notion of consciousness, that we have self-expression and self-subjectivity. Yet, we are also embodied creatures. We live in a body. We live with material reality. We live with the limitations of material form. Now, some of the ways to get around this crisis we are also familiar with. You have the strict scientism of the materialists who would tell you that the idea of free will, self-expression, and agency is simply an illusion. You don't actually have that. You are just, to go back to Thomas Hobbes, a body of matter in motion. You are simply following the laws of physics, of thermodynamics, the laws of motion, as all other objects in the world do. Yet we find this deeply unsatisfying. And so on the other hand, and in reaction to this crude and vulgar materialism is the philosophy of the expressive self, of the subjective, of personhood 
and personality. And yet so many of us and so many people who are proponents of the philosophies of the self seem to be very ignorant of its very origins. William E. Connolly, in his great book, The Augustinian Imperative, explained that even though most of us living in the West today are in a secularized mindset, that is, we don't really have a conception of God as person and love, we are still following that philosophy. And this is what existentialism and even postmodernism is principally concerned with. When you read the existential philosophers, you find out that they are not only constantly referring back to German idealism, you find, perhaps surprisingly, given that many were atheists, a dialogue with Christian theology. Simone de Beauvoir, for instance, wrote that what unites the Christian and the existentialist is the belief that our beginning is in the freedom to love. The only difference is existentialism eventually arrives at the conclusion, as John, as John Paul Sartre does, that it is impossible to love, whereas Christianity says it is very much possible to love. To go back to, go back to Jean Bethke Elstein, when Augustine dethroned that too narrow a conception of rationalism, what she means is that when you read Augustine, who also says that human beings possess a human soul, which is the rational intellect, and that the human capacity for reason is one half of what it means to be made in the image of God, Augustine's combating of that too narrow rationalism in the context of the history of philosophy was his confrontation with the materialist rationalism of the Greek philosophers. Because again, Greek philosophy is principally concerned with the philosophy of the outer world. While there is the Neoplatonic mystic tradition, which is concerned with the world of intelligibility and interiority, that tradition of philosophy was subsumed by Christian theology. This is how you get Boethius in his Consolation of Philosophy addressing philosophy as a person, as Lady Wisdom. But we moderns who live in the aftermath of the rise of the new science no longer adhere to the Christian theological project, or at least not all of us do. And that is what German idealism principally arose to try to redress. While many of the German idealists were themselves schooled in theology, this is, this is true, for instance, of Schelling and Hegel, they do not attempt to deal with the crisis of dualism in theological terms. They attempt to redress the crisis of dualism in philosophical terms. And so while German idealism has many similarities to Christian theology, it is ultimately playing simply in the field of philosophy. And this is very important for us to understand when dealing and wrestling with German idealism. If there is one way to understand the entire project of German idealism and of modern German philosophy, it is this. German idealism is the attempt to restore a holistic understanding of human nature and human existence, one in which object and subject, thing and self, are reunited in a composite existence. And that is the project of German idealism. That is ultimately the project of existentialism. And we might say in agreement with Sartre, that is still the project of modern philosophy.